you know how they say, don't put your hands through the railings because they're sharks? <laughs> I didn't. I thought they were just saying that, like, ah, don't put your hands through the railings, like liability. I didn't think a shark was actually going to try to bite my arm. Welcome to part three of season two of the Inside Out podcast, our look at some of the best stories from throughout the tennis world. My name is Alex Gruskin, and I know I say this at the beginning of every episode, but one of my favorite parts of being a tennis fan is having the opportunity to hear so many of the exceptional stories from not just tennis players, but from fans of the game as well. It truly is an international sport, and tennis is an international language. You can show up at a court anywhere in the world, and if you can show up, you can play a little bit. You've got game. You're going to be accepted into that community, and that's what really makes it, again, such an enjoyable thing for me. That's why it's, I've made it such a big part of my life. Someone else who has made it such a big part of their life, the subject of season two of this Inside Out podcast. And if you've been listening along, you know parts one and two explored the beginning, the origins of his journey, 73 flights, 46 countries, one year traveling across the globe, coming across so many different tennis players, different people along the way. Cameron Moffitt, who joins us again on the show. Cameron, how are you feeling as we had into part three yeah i do well this is uh one of my favorite parts of the story of my journey so super excited to get into it with you now yeah all right well then again quick summary of where we left off your first part of the journey started off in mallorca at the rafa nadal academy it ended in monte carlo at the masters event there uh in both instances you're out on the town in monte carlo you happen to come across stan wabrinka a photo of the two of you can be seen if you're following this series uh along on our youtube channel where super producer daniel westhoff is able to incorporate the incredible photos and video you were able to to compile along the way. Of course, if you want to read more about this journey, you can also find more details on our website, crackrackets.com, uh, where we have his 36, 37 page diary of his event. Uh, again, this Cross Court Chronicles season two has been really enjoyable for me to get into. So let's start off with season three. You end in Monte Carlo, you see the Masters there. I feel like, given the first month you had, I would have been gassed. I would have been like, you know, what I did what I needed to do you I believe return home after Monte Carlo correct yeah so I was staying with a tennis family for for like a month and a half while I was interning in Delray and um or sorry while I was in Miami Miami Open and they had actually moved to Belgium and I'll get into that later on but uh their house was being rented out by another tennis family and so I reached out to them and said hey guys look I'm coming back and I need a place to stay. Can I rent a room? They said, of course, uh, you know, our place is yours. So I get there. It was just an exhausting three weeks. That part, part, uh, the last part was really just three weeks. And I went around to, I don't even know, what is it? Seven countries, seven countries, I think. Yeah. Um, and so when I was back, I just remember sitting in bed and, uh, you know, I, I rested for a couple of days, whatever it was. And I woke up one morning and I was like, you know what? I got to do that again. So I'm looking at a map just on Apple Maps and I look into, uh, uh, yeah, just uh, kind of sc like scrolling around and around the map. And I said, you know what? Uh, one of my friends, when I was in Morocco, I said, hey, guess what, bro? I'm in, I'm in Morocco. I'm in Africa. He's like, oh, you're not really in Africa. You can't say that. He was like, you got to go like that, to, you know, sub-Saharan Africa and you got to see all those countries. And I said, all right, I take the challenge. So I booked uh, a one-way flight to Nairobi, Kenya. <laughs> Uh, again, that's an inclination we've all had before, right? We're just itching to get back on the road. So why not go to Nairobi? But of course, that is where you end up next. And again, the differences between Nairobi and where you grew up and just being in Boca Raton, being in Miami, I have to imagine those differences are stark. Yeah, it was, it was ridiculous because, so I remembered that the sister-in-law of the owner of my favorite yogurt shop in Boca Raton was from Nairobi. His wife is Kenyan and uh, she lives there. So I said, hey, uh, Michele and Anne, do you know anyone uh, that can, um, you know, I guess, show me around a little bit? And uh, Mateu, who was, uh, who was the wife, said, yeah, my sister Anne lives there. 
why don't you sort it with her? So she made this incredible itinerary. She, you know, got booked me at her favorite bed and breakfast right next to her place. And uh, I remember I landed, it was like a 14 hour flight from Miami to Doha and then another seven hours to Nairobi. I get off the plane, it's close to one in the morning, midnight. And uh, I was just like, it was so surreal. I remember I walked off. It was one of those planes where you don't walk off into the airport. You have to walk down like to the ground off the plane and then take a bus. Um, and so it was just, yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. I landed there late at night. We get to the hotel or the bed and breakfast and there's, you know, mosquitoes everywhere. And I'm like, wow, I'm in Africa now, aren't I? Mm-hmm. No, and then again, it's a culture shock. I certainly imagine. And for you, again, I, I suppose this part of your journey a little bit less tennis specific, but just traveling outside of your comfort zone and just being in all of these environments. Uh, you know, again, to get back to the origins of your story, why was this the place you wanted to travel to? See, that's the beautiful thing. You would think that this part of the journey was less tennis specific. And then going to a tennis academy in Spain and going to the Monte Carlo 1000. But that is very incorrect, actually, because this journey took me to so many different tennis federations. So many, I mean, I could argue it was the most tennis of of this entire uh, journey of mine. So I get, uh, you know, of course, the first couple of days were spent uh, not with so much tennis and took me to uh, feed giraffes. <laughs> and uh, play with elephants and uh, you know we took we went down to uh, Kibera which is the slum I got to see that um, you know around town which was great but the next day so yeah so the next day after that we do our sightseeing I wanted to go to Tanzania because I saw it was really close to Mount Kilimanjaro we were six hours drive she found a, a driver a tour guide we woke up at 3 a.m. We went to uh, Tanzania and I wound up going around Mount Kilimanjaro, which was off. I mean, that's one of the most beautiful places on earth. You know, it, you can see the snow and, and we drove through. My, one of my favorite stories is we're at the border of Kenya and Nairobi, or sorry, Kenya and Tanzania. And I did not have a, because the because I booked this trip so last minute, I didn't get the necessary vaccinations and visas that you needed to. And I get to the border and they say, all right, let's see your visa and your yellow fever vaccination, which I had neither. And, uh, you know, as things worked in Bulgaria for me, you know, you slide someone a couple dollars here and there and things kind of go your way. So uh, we, you know, made a nice donation to our friends at the Tanzanian immigration. And I walked out of there with a yellow fever vaccination card and a visa. We, uh, we spent a few hours roaming around Mount Kilimanjaro. And uh, then we went to Amboseli National Park in Kenya. We're going to have fun. We're going to go to Tanzania. We want to see the mountain. Kilimanjaro it is. And again, uh, for listeners who want to view some of the images you were able to capture on your journey, I really do implore you go either read the journal where we've incorporated some of these photos or go check it out on the YouTube channel. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's some of these photos you see are just there. It's breathtaking. I can only imagine what it's like to capture that all in person. Yeah, I mean, it was it was stunning. The waterfalls around the, the park, around Kilimanjaro. I mean, I, obviously, I was only there for a day. I mean, I didn't even get to appreciate, you know, uh, 1% of, of what Mount Kilimanjaro can offer. But just to be there in that aura was so special. And uh, Joe and his wife were with me and our tour guide. And really, we were the only people there. I think it was off season. And so that it was it was pretty remarkable. And when we get, so we're driving back, we go to the Amboseli Park in Kenya. And uh, we get back at around 9, 10 p.m. And I said, you know what? The night is not over yet. So I said, Joe, I said, Joe you have to take me clubbing. You have to take me out. It's like a Tuesday night. He said, uh, Cameron, I'm almost 40. I have a wife and two kids. But you know, he can't take me out, you out is one of my cousins. He's, a, he's an animal. So his name was Dan. So I literally get back from this 20-hour adventure. I'm exhausted. Shower, put on a change of clothes. And we're back at it. We go to, uh, he picks me up, this guy, crazy energy. We have a photo in there, we'll show. Uh, and we go out to some of the bars and it is just so amazing. It's 
tourists it's, and the people that go to Kenya by themselves are really cool people. Let me tell you, because they're not the ones that, that uh, go on the path They're They're out there having a great time. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was a crazy night, 24 hours, no sleep. Yeah. And again, I'm quoting you here from your diary. During a band's live performance of Kenyan folk music, charismatic locals demonstrated rhythmic brilliance and equipped me with the moves I needed to dance to the melodious voices and percussion. We are live on Zoom, so I can ask you to do this. You want to stand up and show me a little bit what those dance moves look like? There is zero chance that that will happen. And only because... <laughs> I have been made fun of so many times by my friends for my ridiculous goofy dance moves. <laughs> when I say, I, I might have misspoke because when I say they equipped me with the necessary dance moves, I mean, they gave me the confidence to dance. Yeah. I don't know. Dance moves were not so good on my end. Yeah. Or they slipped you, how did you describe it? A fee of booze and it was a little liquid courage, yeah. right? There we go. A lot of, lot of Tusker, a lot of, they might put something in that beer, that local beer of theirs. I'm not sure. But uh, it, was a, it was a great night uh, with Dan. And uh, so we get back, obviously, and I'm just exhausted. Like, I have not slept in, you know, probably two days, high energy. And that's when the tennis part of this trip really starts because I went to a local tennis center and took me to, met with the, uh, the kids. And it was inspiring, man, let me tell you, because they, they, uh, they don't have real string. I mean, they string with, like, barbed wire, which is crazy. They all string their own rackets. They walk, they don't have running water where they live. They live in slums. They walk like two miles to this tennis facility to train and uh, walk back late at night, uh, you know, and, and Anne, who she said, I've never even been there. I'm too scared to go. These kids were warriors and, you know, they hit well. And I remember they were playing Monte Carlo on TV. And uh, it was, I think, the Nadal Pella match or something like that, or Medvedev, uh, Medvedev Kyrgios maybe. And I said, uh, you know, I was there like two weeks ago and I showed them pictures and the kids were so amazed. And, you know, I spent a few hours with them just kind of talking and learning about, you know, what they want to do with tennis. And so that was really awesome. And that was how I ended my time in Kenya at the tennis club. Yeah. So again, I want to ask you to explore that a little bit more because you talk about this in your memoir, how these players walk miles to find courts and, you know, they're getting their hands on any piece of, you know, any set of strings, even if it's junk, uh, just because at a certain point to play tennis, that is one of the things you need is a strung racket. And we take that for granted. Uh, I'm sure particularly here in the United States uh, in parts of it, uh, you know, that I, I know for me personally, I could always, my tennis coach, if I I broke a string he'd say give me a racket and he would say you know don't worry I'll string it I'll bring it back and I wouldn't even have to worry about it until at the end he'd say okay 15 bucks and I was like okay like sure um and that's just not the case in 99 percent of the world and so again talk about how sparse the courts were talk about the conditions of just playing in these environments and ultimately to see people thrive in that environment what does that say about their love of the sport yeah, I think tennis for them was definitely a sanctuary where all of them could kind of go and not have to worry about, you know, the stresses of their normal lives. Um, I mean, they were just such good people to me. I think that struck out. But um, yeah, I mean, just with tennis, I mean, how much they loved our sport. You know, I think a lot of times we get lost in these junior tournaments. Kids, you know, either A, don't like tennis and are being forced to play with their parents, their parents are forcing them. Or B, you know, they get burned out, which maybe was the case in my case, to be honest. Uh, you know, why I didn't wind up pursuing college tennis. And for them, they have to work so much harder to be able to attain so much less than we can. You know, we, we complain our Uber is, you know, taking seven minutes to get here opposed to three, you know, and, and for them, it's like, all right, let's walk an hour and a half each way, you know, with, you know, one racket on our backs to these courts to hit. Um, the courts were actually surprisingly decent, um, obviously not comparable to what we have here but they weren't, they weren't that bad. Um, I mean, yeah, they trained hard. They were just out on the courts late at night, 9, 10, 11 p.m. out on the courts grinding and uh, have school in the morning. It was really, really unbelievable to see. Yeah. I mean, it just to see, I, I, I really implore people, go check out the images. I'm speechless because you see some of these things, you just see the conditions. It's so powerful. And it just speaks again, that even if the conditions aren't ideal, you you know, the idea of complaining, I hit this morning and there were cracks on the court. And 
you know, the idea of complaining after seeing those sorts of images or learning of those circumstances about a crack on the court, please. Like, as long as there's a net on the court, as long as, I mean, yeah, you're not, you, you don't want to play if you can find a better court. Obviously, that's always ideal, uh, but certainly uh, there are places where you can't find a better court. And so just be happy that there's a net on the court and that you're able to play tennis. Certainly, it, it gives you perspective. It, you know, allows you to enjoy that. But again, your trip gets better and better, right? Because from there, uh, I know things get uh, e even more fun. Yeah, so I take, I say goodbye to Anne. My, I leave, I wake up at like 2.30 a.m., take a 4 a.m. flight or 5 a.m. flight from Nairobi to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And then from there, just a layover to Madagascar, which is one of the most exotic places in the world, obviously. Um, I arrive in Madagascar and I go through and it's weird. It's very, it's very weird. I don't know. It's just like so densely populated, but so few buildings, I guess. And I get to the, the downtown Antananarivo to say, um, beautiful hotel. It was $25 a night. I don't even know if it's possible. And it was a beautiful, beautiful hotel. So that just shows to show you how far our dollar goes over there. And, uh, did some sightseeing in the day, which was great. I saw the lemur park, which is great. Played with lemurs. Uh, like, you know, Madagascar, you see King Julian and the lemur. And, and so that was great. But uh, after I told my driver, I said, look, let's go to, um, he didn't speak great English. So we spoke a little bit in French because I can get by a little bit. And uh, we get to the, the tennis federation and I see one of the players, you know, playing well, like a very, very good player. And I said, well, I didn't expect that. So I go up to him and he spoke good English. He said, well, I'm on the Davis Cup team here in Madagascar. I'm one of the best players. I said, you know what? I don't have any uh, shoes. I have my flip-flops. You let me a racket, we'll play. So we played, uh, you know, just hit a little bit, uh, you know, did a tiebreaker. Well, hopefully we can show the ace. Uh, can we make that happen? Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it was good. I had a good time with them. And I actually said, you know what? Let's go out. It was like a Friday night. Rally, rally the troops, rally your boys, and uh, come pick me up at the hotel around midnight. So we went out, they picked me up, and it was uh, a little bit sketchy, to be honest. They picked me up in this big white van. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, Madagascar at night. It is a little bit of a different animal. But uh, we get there. It's a fun time. It's a good club. Wake up the next morning, and I go to another tennis club. There was a tennis tournament going on. This one was a little farther. Very beautiful place. A lot of uh, French people, they come to Madagascar because it was a French colony. And uh, from there, we played. Uh, I met one of, the, one of the young players. His name was Louis. We're still uh, keeping touch here and there. Hit with him for a little bit. So, yeah, it was, just, it was a lot of tennis that trip, surprisingly. Yeah, and you talk about going out in Madagascar. I assume that doesn't happen if you don't make the connection with these players at these tennis federations. And, you know, to that point, uh, because that's interesting to me, the idea of going to a nation and calling the tennis federation saying, hey, I'm here, what's the tennis situation? You know, if you flew in from France to the U.S. and called the USTA and said, hey, I'm looking for tennis, you know what's amazing is they actually definitely have a program in place to be like, well, where are you? We can find local hitters for you. Uh, yeah. But, you know, in a country like Madagascar, that's even more valuable because there aren't just clubs spread out across the, you know, the country. There aren't just random high schools that have tennis sports uh so to be you know what is it like to connect with a uh, tennis federation whether it be madagascar whether it be wherever you're going how difficult was that process for you not difficult at all i mean my way of doing it was kind of an orthodox i guess but i would look up madagascar itf and i would find where the itf tournament was and most of the time that's played in the nicest club in these smaller in these smaller countries where tennis doesn't have such a big presence or at least as much and so I just literally would show up and I would say, who's in charge? And I would say, hi, I'm Cameron. Uh, you know, I'm here visiting for a couple of days. Would love to uh, meet some locals or play if you have any courts available. And every single time, they're always super sweet, super nice, very welcoming and excited to have someone that's, uh, I guess, excited to learn about 
uh, tennis in their country. And it's twofold because you can learn about, you know, tennis and how the tennis works. And then also the politics side of it, you know, how is the inner workings of the Federation? You know, what, how does things work um, in that regard? And so it, it's super interesting. Yeah. Uh, I imagine when you show up, do you feel like you have to prove yourself on the court? You're like, all right, these people gave me a chance. Yeah. And sometimes I get my ass kicked, which sucks. <laughs> Yeah, I tell them, oh, you know, I you know played a little bit, worked for Nikirios, whatever, and they expect me to be really good. But you have to keep in mind, I'm in flip flops. I haven't picked up rackets, you know, weeks at a time. Playing on clay courts, I grew up playing on hard, and uh, so sometimes it's not so pretty. But uh, but yeah, I mean, that's really not the point. The point is just to have a good time okay. out there and just to experience that sort of thing. And again, it's an international language. You show up looking for tennis, you're able to find tennis. That's such a cool thing. And maybe next time any of our listeners are traveling to a place like Madagascar or anywhere outside of you know their home country, they will consider doing that to find tennis, to incorporate it in the journeys they are taking. For you, your journey stays in Africa. From there, you go to Johannesburg. And again, to just be able to spend this sort of time, Morocco, uh, Johannesburg, uh, Mallorca, uh, at any point, are you just like, this is a joke? Like, what what am I doing here? Yeah, actually, and maybe it was Madagascar or Joburg that that kind of became a thing because I remember I flew there. Um, actually, so I woke up early again because the morning flights are always super cheap. So I always, I always take those, um, wake up. I was supposed to fly to Comoros and then from there to Joburg. I never missed a flight. This was the only flight I had that was canceled, I think. And I wake up, I get to the airport. It's obviously Madagascar, you know, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit more challenging as far as uh, travel is concerned. So I get to the airport and there's just no one there. And I look on a screen and it says flight to Comoros delayed five hours which is not okay. <laughs> I had a two hour layover. Yeah. So I went to the airport, finally some Madagascar, uh, you know, attendant shows up and I said, you know, what's going on? She said, all right, we'll, we'll give you a, they paid, I guess, for a hotel and nice breakfast, this fancy hotel for me and booked me on a one way to Joburg. So that was great. Uh, I got to spend a little extra day in Madagascar, but I get to Joburg and uh, beautiful place. Uh, first thing I do, I, I go to the hotel reception. I said, I'm looking for a tour guide. And they say, okay, we'll call. We have just the guy for you. His name is Bongani. And uh, so the next morning, Bongani takes me to, I go to, we go to one of the, the biggest tennis federation, tennis, I think the tennis federation in, in Joburg, the main one, it's beautiful. And then we go to uh, play with lions at the Lion and Safari Park. The tears, killing tears, that is with tears. Oh. He took me to Nelson Mandela's house. He took me to the, uh, the F&B Stadium, where the World Cup was in 2010. <laughs> it was a great day of sightseeing for me, but it really started kicking the gear the next day because I had this great plan in mind. We were gonna go to Lesotho, which is a small country not many people have heard of. It's about six hours drive from Joburg, and, uh, and then come back and then do another trip after that. So we go, he picks me up 4 a.m., 5 a.m., we drive to Lesotho on these windy roads that don't really have any, you know, pavement, it's just cracks everywhere. And we get there and it's, I don't want to say like a McDonald's of immigration, but kind of, because you don't actually leave your car. You just hand them your car out the window, you hand them your passport from the window and they stamp it and you're in. So we get in and uh, we do some sightseeing around and in Lesotho, they do not like South Africans because they look at them kind of as the oppressors, so to speak. And Bogani is wearing a camouflage hat, like an army military hat. And we show up to like one of these government buildings and they know he's from Johannesburg because the way he talks. And it just did not end well for us because they were, um, yeah, they were uh, a little bit uh, offended by Bogani's outfit. And so we left there, uh, stayed in Lesotho, but we left that area. And uh, we went up this beautiful tower or beautiful mountain, Baba Boisu Mountain. Yo, oh, you're very fast there. With our, uh, with our tour guide who was teaching us about, you know, I mean, economically there, it's, it's a lot less developed in South Africa. People living off just a few dollars a day, living in huts. There was not even really any restaurants we saw and we were in the capital. 
but beautiful country. We'll pull up some of the pictures. Um, so it, it was a great time. And from there, I went to the Tennis Federation. And there, it's a little different because unlike Kenya, the courts were destroyed. Uh, some of them. Some of them were, were nice, but some of them were destroyed. And I had the unbelievable opportunity to hit with these kids. They were five, six, seven years old, maybe. And I played uh, some tennis with them, some mini tennis. They didn't speak uh, great English, but uh, it, it was great. It was really rewarding time to spend some time with them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you again, talk about this more in your journal. You can see photos you took while there. You know, some of these nations don't host ITF events, right? And you mentioned this point in your journal. And so for them, exposure to any sort of tennis uh, at any sort of level, just the, for, for them to get that sort of confirmation uh, that the high level tennis exists elsewhere, that's significantly helpful that people follow the sport as closely there. And I'm sure they saw some of the way you hit the ball and they're like, whoa, this guy must be legitimate. And you're like, no, I suck. Um, I'm not saying you suck, but you, you know, you go from, no, I do to, <laughs> yeah, no, but you know, uh, just as to say, I just, again, the perspective that provides, I imagine that's amazing. And again, you know, we could talk about your journey in this part to Africa for probably three hours, but as you look back, uh, because I know you were there for a little bit longer, I believe you go from Johannesburg to Cape town. Um, but for you just, uh, again, as you look back at this portion of your journey, what were your takeaways from spending this amount of time again in somewhere so completely different than Miami and you know for, what did you learn again about the international nature of the sport of tennis yeah I mean that that three days in Joburg was really the most energetic and exciting time because from Lesotho we actually went back to Joburg and before going to Cape Town Bongani picked me up and we were going to do a seven hour drive each way through Swaziland, which is a small country. We stopped there for a bit. And then we were on our way to Mozambique. And I write about it in the memoir. I won't talk about it as much here, but we pretty much got stopped at the border because Bongani's car had a crack in it. And they said, the only way you're getting in, and I didn't have a visa, is if you take these two hitchhikers and you drive into Maputo. And mm -hmm. the country is known for carjackings and like carjacking murders. But I was like, I, well, I've come too far. I'm getting that visa and we're going to Maputo. So we pick up these two hitchhikers. We drive around, uh, you know, Mozambique with them. Super friendly guys. They show us around. I said, I invited them out to dinner. I said, guys, it's been such a great day. Let's go to dinner. Showed me the fish market. I saw Maputo at night, which I don't think many people can say. I was there for four hours only. And then, uh, yeah, from there to Cape Town. But overall, I mean, I think just kind of the way I want to describe it is tennis just has its unique twist on everything I do. You know, I was in Kenya, tennis, Madagascar, tennis. I was in South Africa, tennis. I was in Lesotho, tennis. And so um, I think tennis just provides such a unique outlook on everywhere I was really going. Mm -hmm. And it's part of what makes sharing this journey so special as well, uh, because I imagine, you know, you go from there to Cape Town, you go to Cape Point, I believe, as well. You go all across. Um, and from there, you do not go back home to Miami. Your next part of your journey takes you to Dubai, uh, where, again, you get to see another incredible high level event. And that will be, uh, you know, that's a little tease for our listeners of what to expect from part four. Again, Cameron, I want to give you the final a word here as you look back at the Africa swing of your trip uh, just uh, if your favorite part of the journey yeah favorite part of the journey for me was Africa looking back on it I mean to be you know, in Cape Town it's stuff I ride more and, and you can check out the videos if you guys like but you know skydiving <laughs> stop shaking and smile and wave <laughs> Good one. I was in doing shark oh, diving. We gotta do we gotta do three minutes on the double diving, on the shark and the sky diving. A, which is more exhilarating? B, talk me through the five seconds before you're like, oh my god, I'm about to jump. So I did shark diving on the first day, right after I got there. I got there late. I got there in the day, and then shark diving the next morning. Picked me up at five a.m. and you know how they say 
don't put your hands through the railings because they're sharks. <laughs> I didn't. I thought they were just saying that, like, ah, oh, don't put your hands through the railings, like liability. I didn't think a shark was actually going to try to bite my arm. And I have a video of it that we can show, but I put my hand through the railing, I had an underwater camera, and the shark literally almost bit off my hand. I had oh. to my hand back. And there's a video of the shark biting, uh, biting my hand almost. Uh, so that was interesting. Then uh, the next day, I did, um, yeah, we went to Cape Point, which is known to be the southernmost uh, point of Africa. Uh, you know, there's, it, it was beautiful. You can see where the two oceans divide. And then I saw an ad for skydiving and I was like, all right, I'm calling them up. So I called them up, was there 45 minutes later and uh, jumping off a plane not too long after, which was also pretty, uh, pretty exhilarating, just free fall for, you know, 20, 30 seconds. I don't remember exactly, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a magical time in Cape Town. The five, were you someone who were like, I'm closing my eyes, just jump when you're ready? Or were you like a three, two, one, I'm looking down? No, I was like, a, we're going three, two, one. I had a, you gotta have a guide with you. So I was like, we're sending it ready. And he was like, all right, let's go. I mean, so we jumped and it was fun. I get chills just thinking about the idea and I want, I, I don't not want to do it. I'm, I'm 50, 50 right now, if I could even pull it off, but the perspective of like looking down, I feel like the first three seconds, like, what do you do to practice? The, like, how do you, I, I just want to know, what does it feel like to fall even for three seconds? Can I just like jump off a high set trampoline and just be like, okay, expect this at the beginning. And then it's going to get a little crazier. And it's totally different from bungee jumping too, because when you're that high, the winds are so strong and it's so cold. Mm -hmm. And so you jump off and my feet were kind of numb. Yeah. And I just remember I was like, it was so different from bungee jumping. Uh, just, I, I don't know, I was, I was having a field day. It was awesome. Yeah. And uh, I remember landing, I was, you know, screaming and having a great time. It was, uh, yeah, it, it was just an absolute blast. The guys that do it are just total, uh, you know, adrenaline junkies. Um, so it was, it was, it was really one of the highlights of, of my year. Was it more nerve wracking when he pulled the chute and you got yanked back up or jumping off the plane? No, jumping off. Cause yeah. I was like, you know, I was like, you know, actually I should title this 74 flights because <laughs> flight that didn't count because it, it was the one that went up, but I didn't come down with it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was, it was awesome.